How we doing, church? Enjoying the, uh, the summer? The return of summer is beautiful outside. Um, I know there are times when you want to complain. Just think about January, or like April 15th this year even, and I'll put it all in perspective. We're doing good. Ready for the word? If, you, um, if this is your first time here at Lyft, welcome. And just to kind of get you up to speed with what we've been doing this summer, actually starting back in April, right after Easter, we, we started this series called I Am With You, and we began to look at every time in the Bible where God said to his people, God said to us, I am with you. And it's, it started in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, of course, and it's going to take us all the way through all of Scripture to the end, to Revelation. It's this amazing reminder that God's Word, the Bible, is all his Word. It all points to Jesus. It's all about him. And uh, I don't know about you, but it's been really, really um, amazing series for me personally, and I hope tonight to be able to show you again how uh, something that happened thousands of years ago uh, to a people that Jeremiah, prophet, spoke to is about Jesus, and it means something for you tonight in 2018. How awesome is that? It's not a history lecture. It's God, the living God, wanting to speak to you tonight, and so I hope and pray that, that he would... Um, speak to you. Now, so we've been in this big series called I Am With You, but the past few weeks, it's felt like a bit of a mini series about Jeremiah. Um, Evidently, God needed to tell Jeremiah several times and the Israelites several times, I am with you. They they needed the reminder. We're going to be in Jeremiah for five weeks, I believe. And uh, in part, that's tough because as we've seen the first three weeks, Jeremiah is a bit of a depressing read at times. Um, so if you need to be built up, you know, go to your version Bible app. Maybe don't start in Jeremiah uh, right away. The poor guy, like he's called the weeping prophet. Now I'm like, I get it. I totally get it. Um, but I mean, he had a big call. He had a big call from God. God sent him as a messenger to say to his people, Israel at the time, hey, you In your rebellion, you're turning your backs against God, and there's a consequence. There's a natural consequence of that. So Jeremiah was given this task, and yet Israel continued to refuse to turn back to their God. And so Jeremiah said, God's warning you, there's there's correction coming. And it was very specific, and it happened in Jeremiah's lifetime. He said, God's told me to tell you that if you don't turn back and repent and turn to him, then your enemy Babylon, this mighty army, will come and overtake you. And they did. It happened. Jeremiah 25. And I want to start here. It's going to sound really hard, but I want to start here because, church, we're going to see the incredible mercy of our God come through the rest of the story. So Jeremiah 25, this is what happens Babylon comes, they destroy the temple, they destroy Jerusalem, and they take God's people away into captivity, into exile. But listen to 25, 15 to 16, just really quick context. It says this, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Jeremiah. He said, take from my hand this cup. Everybody say cup. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath. And make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I'll send among them. Okay, wow, whoa. Why are we starting there? Welcome to church. I thought it was summer. This is supposed to be like a happy time. We're starting there because that's what happened. And in the midst of that is what we're going to read tonight. In the midst of that, Jeremiah 30, if you have a Bible, turn there. It'll be on the screens too. In verse 8. In the midst of that... Our God brings this incredible word and promise of comfort and restoration. So let's read it um, together. I'm always afraid that when I say that, someone's going to think I mean like read it out loud together. I don't mean that. Like I'll read it, you just listen. Okay. Jeremiah 30 verse 8. We ready? Cup of God's wrath. It's got to get better, right? Please. Okay. In that day, so God's going to promise to save them. And this is what he says. In that day declares the Lord Almighty. I will break the yoke off their necks. I will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So, do not be afraid, Jacob my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel, declares the Lord. 
I will surely save you out of a distant place. Your descendants from the land of their exile, Jacob will again have peace and security. No one will make him afraid. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. This is what the Lord says. Your wound is incurable. Your injury beyond healing. There is no one to plead your cause, no remedy for your sore, no healing for you. All your allies have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. I've struck you as an enemy would and punished you as would the cruel because your guilt is so great, your sins so many. Why do you cry out over your wound, your pain that has no cure? Because of your great guilt and many sins, I've done these things to you, but all who devour you will be devoured. All your enemies will go into exile. Those who plunder you will be plundered. All who make spoil of you, I will despoil, but I will restore you to health. And I will heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. Church, let's pray before we get in here. Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. And I pray that as we open it now tonight, you would help us to understand how amazing it is, this promise of your love for us, this promise of this redemption and this deliverance that you've promised even to us and all creation. God, I pray right now you would just allow us to quiet our hearts and our minds and just be present here in this moment and come in expectantly believing that you want to say something to us, us individually and your church today here in 2018. God, we thank you that you're present and alive and so is your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. I told you it was going to get better and I'll make sense of it, I hope. I want you to think back for a minute, though, to, um, to your earliest dating relationship, okay? So think back to, like, high school or late elementary school if you were really popular. <laughs> Some of you will, won't have to think back very long. Others of us will have to go back a bit farther in the memory bank. I want you to think about some of your earliest dating relationships and some of the dumb things that you said or were said to you. So maybe... D- d- did you say this in, in your relationship, or did you have this say, said to you, it's not you, it's me, I got recess? <laughs> you started dating like the week before, and then like this Friday, it's like, you know what, I think we should probably end this. It's not you, it's me. I still really want to be friends. Did anyone hear that? Let's be brave. Is anyone still friends with them? <laughs> what, about, what about this last one? I think we're drifting apart. Did you ever hear that? I think we're drifting apart. Oh, really? It's also the last day of school. Interesting. (laughs) That works out. I think we're drifting apart. Um, In all seriousness, though, when distance in a relationship does happen, like a real relationship, not grade eight or nine, but when, when distance in a relationship does take place, or you think it is, you feel like it is, That can be painful and tough to navigate, can it? Have you ever felt far away from God? Have you ever felt like God's just not close anymore? Like, God, we're drifting away. (laughs) You've drifted away. I've drifted away. One of us has. Have you ever felt distant from God? It's an interesting experience, isn't it? Because on the one hand, it's very tough to describe exactly what we mean when we say that. And yet, as I say that, many of you, if not all of you, are saying, yeah, yeah, I've been there. It's both tough to describe, but it's universally experienced, this distance from God. I mean, we can kind of try to describe it a bit, maybe, and say, like, I I don't know, like, when I go to pray, I just don't feel, like, close to God, or I just don't feel like there's a point. When I go to church and I try to worship everybody around me singing, and I'm just like, I... I can't muster it. I just don't want to talk about my faith. We, you know the feeling, I'm sure, of being distant from God. And I think what happens in those times, trying not to say seasons anymore, Sarah. What happens in those times is we can let emotions rule, can't we? And we just say, well, you know what, then I'm just going to sit back and wait for this to feel different 
before I do anything about it. I'm not going to reach out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to just going to push through. I'm not going to persevere. I'm just going to wait and maybe God will like do something different and I'll just feel different. I'll feel closer to God. But I mean, how long does that take? Like, and maybe some of you here tonight are just, you're there right now. Like, I will guess I'll go to church, it's good. But like, I don't feel like God is close. I feel like he's far away from me. Church, I want to remind us tonight that because of Jesus, the distance is not insurmountable. In fact, I actually believe that though you might feel like you're far from God, he right now is actually closer than you realize. You think about Israel, in the situation that they found themselves in, they hear Jeremiah come and say, okay, um, because you've rebelled against God, this, is, this captivity, this exile is going to happen to you, and you're going to be scattered and living in fear. Think about Israel. I mean, they could not have felt more far apart, more distant from God than they did in this moment. Try to imagine what that would would have been like. I mean, you're you're now in in, in a foreign land. Many of them were enslaved. Uh, If you're a parent or a grandparent, you're probably worried about the life that your kids and your grandkids are going to come into. There's fear and questions about why would God let this happen? I know Jeremiah was trying to tell us, but like, we didn't think he would really mean it. How long are we going to be here? I mean, there's doubt and confusion and feeling of being overwhelmed and far from God. And if we think that it's, well, not a big deal, that their country, their nation was divided, just go on social media to anyone who lives in the U.S. and you'll see the fear of a divided nation. What they were going through, church, what I'm trying to say is what they were going through is this, this, this extended period of time in which their God felt far away. As they were told, I'm going to pour out this cup of wrath. But here's the thing. The incredible thing. God begins to weave so beautifully right in this passage we read. He's trying to tell them, even though this is where you are right now, even though you feel like I am far away, I am actually closer than you think. God says to his people, look again in verse 10 and 11. Here's the, here's the promise he begins to give them. He says, I will save you out of this distant place. I will save you and your descendants from the land of their exile. I am with you and I will save you. I'll save you out of a distant place and bring you back. Now, I was thinking about that promise, if they could have truly heard it, because I, I have to imagine that as this happened, one of the first thoughts that many of them must have had was, Um, is this going to be our new forever? Have you ever thought that? You go through a difficult time in life and go, is is this my identity now? Is this my new normal? Is this going to be forever? But hear what God says. He says, no, it's for a time. It is correction. It's not forever. I will save you out. I will bring you back. I will bring you back. Church, I think often when we feel far from God, not always, but often, What is fueling that distance is a difficult trial in your life, a sickness, a relational tension, losing a job, not knowing where life is going. And you you start to feel distant from God because you think, is this now my new normal? Will this diagnosis be my forever identity? Will this trial be my new normal? Is it going to be my forever? And God says, no, no, I... It might be for a time, but I've not abandoned you. I'm closer than you think to save you out of that distant place. Church, no trial, no diagnosis, no relational fallout even will be your identity in Jesus. You're a child of God. Your circumstance will never be your forever identity. This was God's message to Israel. Yes, I have sent this correction to you. Yes, it will be for a time and it will be painful, but it is not your identity. Did you notice the language, Jacob, my servant? They, still, they were still God's children. And he promises, I will save you from that distant place. But I think another aspect to the distance they must have felt was, was that Israel was, imagine, I imagine, thinking, okay, if we're going to get out of this exile, if we're going to get out of this season, it's going to be up to us. 
In other words, I imagine what was fueling the fear was we have to figure this out. Our future is in your hands. And that, of course, is pretty hopeless. But the promise of Jeremiah 30 is that they weren't in their own hands. Yes, the rebellion had driven them from God, but they could never be out of his reach. You can never be beyond the reach of our God. Church, if we could only receive the depths of this truth, the arm of the Lord is mighty in strength, resilient against obstacles. It's farther reaching and more relentless than you will ever understand. And if you feel far from God tonight, please hear this. I want to read Psalm 139 to you. The, the, the arm of the Lord is mightier and farther reaching than you could ever realize. Listen to what David said, Psalm 139, verse 7 to 10. He, said, he says to God, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Hope begins to glimmer as you realize that a feeling of distance from God never actually means in reality that you're beyond his reach. You might feel very far away and it might be for a long time, but church, you're never beyond your reach. God won't reach down and be like, oh, sorry, you've gone too far. I, I can't. You're never beyond his reach. Often I'll be talking to somebody and, and kind of listening to them express this feeling of, I just, don't, I just don't feel it. I just don't know where God is. I feel like he's far away. And they're sharing what they're experiencing, but I'm thinking to myself, you all, oh, you don't realize how close he is right now. You don't realize how close your God is right now. And the reason I know that, church, is because throughout the whole, all scripture, and I'm going to show you how it is tonight, God continues to reveal the gospel, the good news of his love, even through this, this passage. The overarching message of, of, of Jeremiah 30 was, yes, I have brought this correction to you, but I have not forgotten you. I am still your God. I'm still your father. Even when you feel like God is far away, he's actually closer than you know. Now, I want to unpack that a little bit more because it's not that simple, but it is that beautiful. It wasn't that simple for Israel or us because the distance that they felt, okay, it wasn't simply um, a moral or a behavioral issue. That was part of it, but it went deeper. Listen to how God describes it in verse 12. He uses this incredible image. In verse 12, it says, this is what the Lord says to Israel. Your, your what? Say it with me. Your, your wound. Not your behavior. Not your actions. Your wound is incurable. Your injury beyond healing. Do you see how the distance they felt was further complicated? It wasn't just a behavioral issue that we can switch back on. Yes, they had rebelled, but it went deeper. It wasn't just that they were bad, it's that they were sick. Their hearts needed healing, church. They were dying, as it were. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, separation from God, and therefore life. You see, what the issue was for Israel is the same as it is for all humanity. We are rebellious at heart. We have a wound. They would failed to live in a relationship with God, but it went deeper than failing up to a standard. They had a sinful heart, a wound that needed healing. And so you fast forward a few, a few thousand years, and it's the same wound that inflicts us all. Rich, poor, old, young, blue collar, white collar, clergy collar, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And that's what made this complicated and very deep in this situation. Because normally, when you sense distance, normally, okay, typically, when you sense distance in a relationship, all you have to do is just make an effort to get closer, right? For example, who, uh, show of hands, married couples who are here. Married couples. Okay, so we have a few married couples. Married couples know this. When you feel distant, what do you do? Date night, right? <laughs> so if you have kids, call and grandma, grandpa, babysitter, and you break that cycle of distance, right? Life's been crazy. I don't even feel like I know you anymore. We gotta break, we're gonna turn off the phones, we're gonna go out. 
and we're going to have a date night. We're going to make an effort and get closer, right? You perceive a distance, and you draw closer. Easy, fun. You do it in other relationships, friends and family. You feel distant, let's, let's meet up. I haven't seen you in forever. Like, you just make an effort, you get closer. Um, Rachel and I did this last weekend. R- recently, my sister and brother-in-law moved down to California for work. And so we're like literally separated from them, distant, and we felt it. And so what do you do in 2018 when you have distance in a relationship? Eventually, you book a ticket down to California and you stay for free. But in the meantime, you Skype and you hold up your laptop and you walk it around the house because they haven't even seen our house yet. Like, here's the tour, trying to get seasick. Here's the bathroom, yeah, here's the... And then my sister took her phone and walked around their new condo. Here's our bathroom and here's our kitchen. And then we put the dogs in front of the screen. We're like, here's the dog and the puppy, wave. Suddenly, though you're way across two countries, you feel like you're closer, right? You make an effort, you draw closer. Unfortunately, when the distance is complicated by an incurable wound... A rebellious heart that prevents a relationship, the issue is greater. What I'm saying is we can't just make an effort to get back to God or to to, to collapse the distance. It's not a road back. It wasn't just that Israel was bad. What they needed and what we need, church, what we needed was healing. A new heart and a new way to relate to God. And I love this. This is so beautiful because it's right there. It's right when you feel like God's been piling on and it's like, hey, how else can you make us depressed, God? It's right there. Verse 17, listen to what he says. God's been saying your wound is incurable, your injury is beyond healing. Verse 17, I will restore you to health and I will heal your wound. Please don't miss how incredible this is, church. This is God's word for all of us. Your wound is incurable. You have a sickness of heart. Your situation is hopeless. And then God says, and I will cure it. I will heal it. I'll do it for you. This is our God. This is the gospel. The gospel isn't, hey, it actually turns out sin isn't that bad, so we're all good. The gospel, as Tim Keller says, is you are more sinful than you will ever realize, but you are more loved than you can ever imagine. God steps in and says, your wound is incurable, your injury beyond healing, Israel, and I will heal it. And so through the mess of the Old Testament, God continues to weave these amazing promises of a savior. We now know, of course, Jesus. And he promises this one who would come and give us a new heart, One who would come and make a way for us to have a new relationship with God, a new possible relationship with God. He promises a savior who would be able to bring us near, us who are far, us who feel far from God, bring us near to him. I mean, even in the midst of this depressing, weeping prophet, God speaks this promise. Look at one chapter over. I'm kind of cheating, but it's okay. One chapter over, Jeremiah 31. This This is incredible. The people are in exile and God's already talking about Jesus. Jeremiah 31, 33. He's talking about a new covenant, which is another way of saying a new relationship. He says, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, a new heart. From the least of them to the greatest, I will, listen to it, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Just try to imagine hope beginning to slowly flicker as God's people, in the face of devastation and fear, hear their God once again say, I have not forgotten you. A day is coming and it will come soon. I will renew my relationship with you. I will be your God. You will be my people. But church, it wasn't just for them. Please don't hear this and go, okay, cool history lesson. No, no, this is for us. Because you fast forward to the New Testament and the writer of Hebrews in chapter 8 quotes that exact passage and says, guess what, church? That's Jesus. 
That's Jesus. That's us. We had the incurable wound, and God said, I will heal it, and he sent Jesus. That's what he's done. He's brought a new way, a new covenant, given you a new heart that you might not be far from God, but brought near to the Father. Now, I I mean, I think it's incredible. I hope you do too, that God says, I'm gonna heal it. It's amazing. But what's further amazing is how God said he was gonna do it. And it's also kind of surprising. And you can trace it back through all of scripture. These messages of this savior, they kind of, got missed at the time because they didn't sound very heroic. I mean, if we were to draw up an ideal savior of the world, right, it would be like this huge mash of Avengers type looking people, right? Like, and then there's people like Isaiah in chapter 53, and he's like, God told me about the savior of the world, and listen to how Isaiah describes it. He calls him a suffering servant. Really? Really? <laughs> Savior of the world, suffering servant. But listen how beautiful this is, church. Again, talking about Jesus. Verse 4, Isaiah 53. He says, Surely he, Jesus, speaking prophetically now, took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And listen to this, church. By his wounds, we are healed. What did God say to Israel? You have a wound. This distance is because of a wound, and I'm going to heal it. I'm going to send one to heal it. And in fact, what's going to happen is he's going to be wounded in your place, and by his wounds, you will be healed and brought back to me. And so Jesus comes from the Father and he lives a perfect righteous life that Israel couldn't live, that we couldn't live. And though he didn't deserve it, he stood in our place and he was wounded on our behalf that we might be then made righteous through his sacrifice. Church, by the wounds of Jesus, you can be healed, given a new heart and a new way to relate to God. No longer enemies, no longer fearing him, no longer scattered, no longer far apart, but brought near to the Father, a child of God. Your wound is incurable, God says, and I'm going to heal it. Don't be afraid. I will save you out of a distant place and bring you near again. Church, if you feel far from God tonight, in Christ you never are, because by his wounds you've been healed and he's brought you near to the Father. He's actually closer than you could imagine right now. So what do we do? I mean, that's cool, right? But maybe you're thinking, all right, but what do I do? I still feel far from God, and I have for some time. What do I do now, tonight? What do you got for me, preacher? I need something. What do you do? Church, all you have to do is remember. If you're in Christ, just remember. Here's what I mean. Three days after Good Friday, three days after watching Jesus brutally crucified, some of his closest friends and followers went to his burial place to mourn. Except many of you know the story. Of course, they went and they found the body was gone. And so they're freaking out. What do we do? What does this mean? And suddenly, Jesus appears. And he appeared to the disciples and his friends and followers several times. It wasn't a ghost, it wasn't a vision, it was Jesus resurrected in the flesh, Jesus risen from the dead. And so he appears to his disciples, but the problem was the first time he did that, not all of them were together. One of them, named Thomas, wasn't there. Do you remember this story? Thomas wasn't there. And so the other disciples come back and they go, we've seen Jesus. And Thomas goes, I don't believe it. And so everyone just calls him Doubting Thomas. It's like, well, like then call me Doubting Alex, right? Like, (laughs) poor guy. He wasn't there to see it. And, you know, I think about this week, I'm like, I wonder, too, in addition to him being skeptical, I wonder if actually Thomas felt a bit left out. Like, Jesus could have come appeared to me and not you guys. Left out Thomas, maybe that's what we should call him. How how come he didn't come to me? Maybe, and, and maybe... 
part of the distance, when you feel far away from God, part of it is like further compounded by you looking around at church and like everyone else seems close to Jesus. I feel far away and yet people here have their arms raised and they're into worship and then the sermon time comes and they're taking notes and I'm like, cool, yeah, I hate you all, <laughs> right? Like in love, of course, but like I kind of hate you. Like, yeah, dude. Thomas is stewing a bit. I don't, I, I don't believe that. No, you guys didn't really have that encounter. I don't believe that. And this is what he says in John 20, 25. He said, okay, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. Unless I touch his scars. A week later, the disciples are in someone's house, are on the supper table. Jesus shows up again, and Thomas is there. And Jesus says in verse 27, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Touch my scars. By my wounds, you're healed. Church, the farthest you will ever be away from God is simply the length of your reach to touch his scars. That's it. When you feel far from God, how do you get back? You don't have to get back. You just have to remember. Just reach out to remember. By his wounds, I've been healed, and I'm actually not far from God. I've been brought right to the Father. By his wounds, I've been saved from a distant place and brought near to God. Though I feel distant from God, I'm actually closer than I know right now. Just reach out to remember And I love it because it's not that far. It's just across the supper table. Thomas, here you go. Touch the wounds, touch the scars, and remember. Just across the table. I love that image because four days earlier from this encounter, Jesus was having supper. He hasn't died yet. He's having supper with the disciples. And he realizes this is going to be the last time. So let's call it the Last Supper. And... And as they're having supper, Jesus said, okay, guys, this is the last time we're going to have this, this dinner like this. And so from now on, he said to them, here's what I want you to do. When you eat this meal together, I want you to do it intentionally, and I want you to do it in remembrance of me. And so he took the bread they were eating, and he broke it, and he said, so when you eat this meal, remember, this is, kind of, is going to be like my body that's broken for you. And then... Check this out. He took the cup of wine and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood just poured out for you. Seated across the table, Jesus all of a sudden offers this this cup, a new invitation, a new way of relating to God. And I'm sitting here thinking, wait, we deserved the cup of God's wrath, didn't we? Remember Jeremiah 25? That's what we deserved. How can Jesus sit across the table and offer us a new cup, a new covenant, a new way of relating to God? Church, how can he offer us that? Because by his wounds, we've been healed. He can offer us this cup of a new covenant because after supper, Jesus went into the garden before his death and he prayed. And he said, Father, if there's another way, like, let's do it. And he prayed and he said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but your will be done. And Jesus drank that cup of suffering for us that he could then offer us a cup of a new covenant, a new relationship. By his wounds, you have been healed. Israel, your wound is incurable, but I will hear it, heal it. Church, though the distance might feel far, God is closer than you realize right now. Reach across the table and be reminded of his wounds. That reach doesn't take a whole lot. I think we misunderstand often. We go, well, how I get closer to God is I gotta muster up a lot of faith. And sometimes we don't help each other as Christians. We go, you know, when you pray, did you believe enough? (laughs) Did you have enough faith? We gotta stop doing that. Because Jesus said it's not about the amount of faith. In fact, he said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, that's enough. Why? Because our faith doesn't save us. Who we're putting our faith in saves us. You feel far from God, church, can you muster up faith as small as a mustard seed to just reach across the table and say, Jesus, I believe it. By your wounds, I'm healed. You're not distant. 
Rather than allow your emotions to rule, church, can you muster that faith to remind yourself you've been brought near. He's closer than you know. Let's pray.